Dr. Vinita Shankar, warm welcome to our show. Dr. Vinita Shankar is from the Sasakawa Indian Leprosy Foundation. Dr. Shankar, what, what, what is the seed like for leprosy in India? I believe it's, India has got 60% of the world's leprosy affected. That's right. And we also account for, we have 58% of the all new cases of leprosy in the world occur in India. And in absolute numbers, the figure still is, not, is quite daunting. We have Every year we add 1,30,000 new cases. So the burden of leprosy is very high in India. Although we have achieved what is called the elimination rate, which is less than one person new case, uh, one, less than one new case per 10,000 population. This is a benchmark that was developed by WHO. And at this rate, we believe that the de disease is no longer a public threat. So it technically India has achieved that, but uh, this is only a national figure. Um, if you look at the at the district or the actually if you look at the state level and the district level, you find that even the government has identified over 160 new 60 districts which are endemic, where the rate of prevalence rate is higher than the national average, or which is 0.72, and in some cases the prevalence rate is even higher than one. Going some in, for example, in Dadar and Daman view, it goes up to, uh, I think, close to two. Okay, okay. In terms of public perception, what has the journey been like, especially for your organization, Sasaka and the uh, Leprosy Foundation? Well, uh, Silk or Sasaka and the Leprosy Foundation came into being uh, soon after India had declared itself to have eliminated leprosy. So, uh, which means that they reached that benchmark, which I just mentioned. Um, this was a part, a one wing of a two-pronged um, effort by Mr. Sasakawa of the Nippon Foundation to look to provide assistance to leprosy-affected people uh, who had been cured of leprosy to be reintegrated into mainstream society. So the first thing he did was to help the formation of a group of, of a networking organization, those in networking organization of leprosy affected people themselves, who could then lead the fight for inclusion for their rights uh, themselves. He didn't want a top-down approach. At the same time, because there was a huge need for leprosy affected people to find some alternative source of income other than begging and donation. You know, which is which is absolutely demeaning, and most of them in our conversation with on a, we did a needs assessment, and the first thing they said, that what we aspire and what we really yearn for is dignity, and we cannot be have a dignified life if we have to go out and beg on the streets to put out our hands to sell our disability in order to evoke sympathy. So that that was the background against which Silk came into being. Silk's uh, role and mandate was to provide financial and technical assistance to enable leprosy affected people living in colonies as well as their families because surprisingly even though the families don't suffer from leprosy they still face the same discrimination and stigma so and so to enable the leprosy affected people themselves and their families to access opportunities of financial opportunities educational and technical information opportunities so that they would find some form of employment it was quite clear to us from the very beginning that unless there was a huge change in social perceptions about the disease, unless we had we busted the myths that surrounded it, which made it uh, in people's mind that it was uh, a, a hereditary disease or it was a disease which was a, a retribution for past sins or, um, or it was a dis disease which was uh, genetically transmitted, you know, all those myths that surrounded leprosy had to be busted before you would find any shop, uh, any corporate uh, employer hiring people who are affected by leprosy. No employer would want to create a disturbance on the shop floor. And this certainly would have done because there was such widespread belief that leprosy is a contagious disease. You shouldn't talk to, you shouldn't touch people who've got leprosy because it will pass on the uh, and which is not scientifically, which is not a, not true. So given this kind of social perception, it was clear that wage employment was not an option. And we had to look at other, and obviously self-employment. And given the overall level of education, access to resources, available, you know, 
knowledge of the market, it was clear that the kind of financial assistance that we could provide would be for really for micro enterprises, small things that would enable them to use their the knowledge that is sort of part of our whole cult bring upbringing. For example, everybody sees cows in the rural areas. Everybody knows, you know, more, more or less how to raise a cow, how to milk a cow, or how, at least they know that if you, you know, that's an easy thing to do. So as a result, initially we announced, I mean, we still start, we started off by funding these micro enterprises and enabling, and even there we found that we needed to work a lot in building capacities because people had not real clue how to make a success of this venture. And give, given that they had such low risk taking ability, it was so simple to fall back into begging because it, if it didn't work, they just had to go back to in order to, to support themselves. So we, uh, Sasakawa India Leprosy Foundation, they first started working with not only providing financial opportunity funding, for small projects as we do give grants, but with the grants, we started doing a lot of uh, training and capacity building to ensure that these uh, uh, projects were sustainable in the long run. And we, through this whole process of learn, of earning an income or digni in a dignified way, there, there would be a restoration of self-esteem and self-confidence, which then would take them further in, to take into other ventures that would eventually enable them to break out of begging completely. Okay, okay, that's that's very inspiring. That's a huge spread that you just mentioned. So besides the livelihood program, which I think you just described, what are the other uh, areas that self operates? In? Well, we, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, the, the children of leprosy affected people also face yeah. the same difficulties, mm -hmm. and uh, they don't get an opportunity to access good uh, educational facilities. Most, although technically no government school can refuse admission to mm -hmm. a child from a leprosy background or from a leprosy family. Even within these government schools, there's a lot of discrimination. We have stories of uh, girls telling us, "Ma'am, we um, when the union when we go to school, we have uh, we have to sit a little apart from them. The teacher doesn't come to us. The teacher doesn't touch us. Nobody plays with us. So our friends are only friends from the colony. And uh, given that, and given the level of education and the kind of the quality of education our government schools." These kids are who are often first time school goers really don't have many opportunities and for there are a large number of dropouts, then even those who manage to complete their class 12, they don't have money to take on further uh, further higher studies. So we've got a scholarship program for children from leprosy colonies and there are three um, different verticals to this scholarship program. One is for dropouts of class 10 and 11 people who don't want to study any further and for those we've got a, we've got a, a skillings program where we um, give them access or give, send them to uh, skills based 